Good evening and welcome to Conversations with the Candidates. I'm Tim Lankford. We're speaking tonight uh, with the League of Women Voters of the Houston area. Uh, we're speaking tonight with the with three of the six candidates on the ballot for the Democratic Party, uh, Harris County Precinct 3 Commissioner. We've got Michael Moore joining us this evening, Morris Overstreet, and Diana Martinez-Alexander. They're three of the six candidates, as I said, who are uh, running in the wide open primary, both Democrat and Republican, and wide open seat. Uh, for Harris County Precinct 3. And so we're going to talk with them about some of the issues that affect uh, the West Harris County Precinct, where they're hoping to represent, and the county as a whole. So thank you for joining us this evening. I'd like to welcome all three of you uh, to the program tonight. I appreciate y'all joining us and, and having this conversation with us. Um, uh, Michael Moore, I want to start with you. Um, first question for, for all of you, but we'll start with Michael first. Uh, tell us about yourself and why you are running for Harris County Commissioner Precinct 3. Uh, thanks, Tim. I'm running for Harris County Commissioner Precinct 3 because I believe in public service. Uh, I believe if you, if you feel you can, if you, if you can give back, uh, you should give back. Uh, we have major issues facing Harris County from uh, flood control, three massive 500-year uh, uh, floods in three years. Global warming is real. We're seeing the effects of it uh, here in Harris County. Uh, we've got major issues on flood control. We've got massive growth. We've got 4.8 million people in Harris County. We're going to add another 3 million people uh, in the next two to three decades. Uh, the unincorporated area is growing fast. Uh, we've got a health care system that 54% of its um, patients uh, uh, do not have health insurance. Uh, major other issues. Uh, I was uh, former Bill White's uh, chief of staff for the entire six years. He was mayor. Uh, I've got the experience on running large organizations. Uh, I helped run the fourth largest city in the United States, a $2 billion budget over 20,000 employees. I'd like to use that experience to help Harris County. Okay. Um, thank you so much. And Mr. Overstreet, we'll come to you next. Tim, thank you for, for hosting this and I uh, thank the uh, League of uh, Women Voters. My name is Maurice Overstreet. I'm running for Harris County Commissioner, Precinct 3 in the Democratic primary. I'm a former elected uh, statewide Democratic official. I'm running because I'm a problem solver and there's some problems that exist in Precinct 3 that really do need solving. Flooding. Flooding is a big issue. It's personal to me. I was a victim of all the floods. Three and a half feet in May 2015. Rebuilt. Harvey missed me by three inches. So it's personal. I want to solve the flooding problem. I believe that mankind is smarter than water and we can develop a plan and I have a plan to expand the reservoirs, expand the retention basins to control the water and release it to where it naturally wants to go, that's the Gulf of Mexico. I have a plan to fix the streets. I know everybody's tired of the potholes, traffic congestion. We need to improve mass transportation. I want to reduce crime. I believe that every person is entitled to live in a community that is safe and free of crime. I want to improve the quality of life not only of the citizens who live in Precinct 3, the incorporated parts as well as the municipal parts, but I want to improve the quality of life of all of our citizens in Harris County. That's why I'm running. I'm a fixer. I'm a doer. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And now we'll go to Diana Martinez-Alexander to tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for commission. Sure. Thanks for having me. And I am a lifelong educator and public servant. I've worked in public schools for over 20 years. And using that experience and those um, challenges trying to get can, um, resources connected to people and families that, that need them has been something that I've worked on for, for decades. Um, using that experience along with the revelation that many people had in November of 2016, understanding that just being a regular voter wasn't enough, you had to increase civic engagement by going out and volunteering for campaigns, um, talking to people about issues working against heinous policies that have been put into place with this administration and understanding that everyone has a role in making our community better. So uh, where there wasn't infrastructure to address uh, immigration reform, we created it and we were um, trying to uplift immigrant families. and. 
that kind of made me understand how all of these issues are connected together. Access to services, when we don't have a climate crisis plan, those who are underserved feel it the most. And so we have to work to address those barriers and also make sure that we have a clear um, county climate crisis plan and also be very transparent in how we're making budgetary decisions. So all of that experience has made me decide that using um, my background as a uh, person who's had a working family um, background, it, it provides that perspective that can be uh, make a difference in Precinct 3 to all working families. Wonderful. So here you're talking about uh, part of the reasons that you got into the the race in the first place was because of flooding issues. You all have plans of your own for flooding. Um, and I know that's been a major concern, and not just in Precinct 3, but all across the county. Um, the, the infrastructure is maybe just not there to support the water that, that we're now forecast to see again and again and again over the next coming decades, coming years and decades. So. Uh, Mr. Overstreet, I'm going to start with you first. What, uh, if you're elected commissioner, what steps would you take to address flooding in Precinct 3? Well, first we have to realize that climate change is, is real, and we're going to continue to have the flooding events. We should never have allowed individuals to build their homes and businesses in flood zones. And so one of the things that I'm going to propose is that we buy out homes and businesses in flood zones pay the residents, the owners, a fair market value for their property, use that land to expand the capacity of the reservoirs as well as retention bases. That is the primary focus of how I think we can control flooding. And when I say control flooding, you can't stop it, but you can stop its destructive nature in our communities by controlling the water and releasing it in a timely fashion so that it can make its way to the Gulf of Mexico. All right, and uh, Ms. Uh, Martinez-Alexander, let me know that you have the next word on that. What would your plans sure. look like if uh, you're elected Precinct 3? Sure, so it's not just being um, reactive to the water that needs a place to go, but also being proactive in creating that climate crisis plan. So if we're um, looking at businesses that can use incentives to green their business and use less resources and decrease the carbon footprint um, of the Harris County facilities as well as private businesses, that should be part of the plan. Also, making sure that we have plenty of green space. Uh, Mr. Overstreet is correct. We've had, we have a lot of um, places where bus uh, businesses and uh, homes have been built that shouldn't have been built and we have to go back and figure out a solution for that because the water needs a place to go. People are scared every time it rains and until we have a proactive solution, we're just going to feel like victims the entire um, county and we shouldn't feel like that every time it's going to rain. Okay. And uh, Mr. Moore? Uh, we currently have $2.5 billion in bond, uh, bonds that we're, we've got a number of projects that, that, that are already uh, started or in the pipeline. Uh, supposedly it's going to take 10 years to, to uh, implement and, fi and finish all those projects. We need to speed that up. Uh, we have the next rain event is over the horizon. Uh, we don't have enough capacity. We don't know, have, have enough throughput. We need to do that first. That's number one. Uh, it's not enough. Uh, the rains are going to, uh, climate change is going to get worse. We're going to have more water. We've been trying to uh, control water. We can't control water. We need to learn how to manage water. We need to change the way we're doing things. We do need a lot more green infrastructure. Um, the, uh, you got to take each, each, uh, uh, the Attic's Dam and Baker, uh, Barker's Dam need, the Corps of Engineers needs to go ahead and increase capacity. I know they're looking at uh, increasing capacity in attics. That dam is still, even if they fix the gates, it's still on the list of the, one of the most uh, dangerous dams in the country. Corps of Engineers needs to fix that. Um, we've got, uh, we need to, uh, we're going to add another 3 million people to the 4.8 million here, which causes all kinds of problems. We're going to get denser. Um, one of my plans is to uh, save the Katy Prairie. 
They've got well, almost 15,000 acres uh, that they own, 9,000 acres under management. We need to do everything we can to, uh, uh, to help them preserve what they've got, uh, let it act like a sponge. Um, it's in a 100-year, 500-year floodplain. We can't develop it. If we develop it, we're just causing more problems for ourselves. So we've got major issues. We need to jump on it now. Um, I've got the experience. Uh, to make that happen, uh, to move it forward. I'm lucky to have the endorsement of Jim Blackburn, who is uh, a leading environmentalist and leading expert on flood control here in uh, the region. So okay. there's a lot more. Right on. So I want to piggyback off of that because all of you say that, that uh, it, it's a balancing act for development of Harris County and especially with the west side of Harris County, which is the part that's growing. Uh, for the most part. So how, how would your plans balance both uh, de development and while also, uh, you know, keeping the county safe and the residents that are there and the future residents safe from future flooding? And I'm going to start with you. Okay. So okay. I've been out talking to residents in West Harris County and some people are still not recovered from Harvey. And so when we make decisions about development, we have to realize that there are real consequences to those decisions. If we decide to put development in an area that could be flood prone, we're putting those families at risk. Uh, Mr. Silva in West Houston is still washing dishes in his bathtub because he hasn't recovered from Harvey. So using that as a lens and realizing that developers shouldn't have free reign to develop willy-nilly um, and being thoughtful and using the input from the Corps of Engineers and putting a rein on to that development and being thoughtful about it and also developing that trans, um, transportation infrastructure because if we're enticing people to, to get more cars off the road that will cumulatively lessen our carbon footprint as a community and we need to explore that um, aggressively if we're going to make an impact as a community. Okay. And Michael Mark, come to you next. And the, the question again. The, how do you balance the protecting the existing and future residents from flooding while also encouraging development in West Harris County in Precinct 3? We're going to have to uh, encourage economic development. We have to have it. Uh, you have to have it as a growing economy, jobs, uh, infrastructure. But you can do it smarter. Um, you can create green infrastructure that spurs uh, uh, more dense um, neighborhoods, um, uh, uh, business centers, work centers. Um, we need to look at that. The county almost needs to become its own mud and develop uh, these green centers that are higher density. Um, and also we have to develop a better transportation plan to those centers. Uh, so it is more green infrastructure while you're developing um, flood prone areas. Uh, I agree with the court, uh, the commissioner's court, when they had a 5-0 vote to use the Atlas 14. Um, uh, it's 500 year flood, flood plain. Um, and so um, the, we have to do it smart. We have to warn people. They, they, you can't build in a, in a, in a, in a flood pool uh, uh, that uh, has been there since the 1950s. Uh, that's just awful. Uh, so more green infrastructure, uh, uh, that brings in more capacity uh, for water um, along with uh, fixing the current uh, system we have. Okay. Mr. Overstreet, I'll give you the last word on this question. Well, in addition to being a lawyer for 45 years, I've been a successful small business person. So I believe in business. There are some basic business principles no matter what business that you're in. I believe that there ought to be some do's and some don'ts. So let's talk about the do's and the don'ts. Do not let developers develop in flood zones. Do not let them do it. Uh, their influence on commissioner's court has been too much. Uh, my position is we're going to put people first, not money first. I believe in business, but I also believe in the quality of life that we have to offer and ensure that the citizens not only of Precinct 3, but all of Harris County enjoy. So what are those do's? If you create impervious cover, then you have to create pervious cover. That's more green space. That's more parks. The water has to have some place to go. We can do that. That's a requirement. You create impervious cover, then the requirement is you create pervious cover. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna move on to, a, to another uh, 
question that kind of goes beyond flooding, but um, you each mentioned transportation issues uh, for your precinct um, and, and how, to, how to improve that. And, and what does that look like? What does your plans look like to do that, to work with Metro, to work with TxDOT? How, how will that work out? And I'll start with you, Mr. Moore. Um, I supported the Metro, Metro Next plan, um, the bond uh, they just passed recently. We need to get that uh, up and going, um, uh, get that investment in place. We are going to have to come up with new transit alternatives, uh, and that includes TxDOT and includes HGAC, Houston Galveston Area Council. Um, we've got the widest freeway in the world uh, uh, in Katy Freeway. We didn't take the opportunity when they built it to put some kind of mass transit on it. We had a rail line sitting there and we lost the opportunity where we could have put some mass transit, whether it be rail or bus rapid transit. We can't let that happen again. So we've got these corridors of 290, I-10, West Park, and, and uh, 59. We need to start looking at those nows to get uh, high capacity transit. I believe in bus rapid transit. I believe bus rapid transit is the way to go. Rail's expensive. You build rail enter, you use uh, bus rapid transit uh, on the outskirts. Um, and uh, it's going to have to be efficient, it's going to have to be fast, and it's going to have to be clean and has Wi-Fi, so people are going to use it. Uh, but we've got these major suburbs that are growing and growing and growing. We're going to have to do something now when those three million people come in the next two to three decades. We can't wait till they come and then try to fix it when they get here. Okay. Mr. Overstreet. You know, some of the largest cities uh, give us a model and a road map for expanding uh, public transportation. It's an educational process. Every person does not have to drive his or her car downtown because they work downtown. What we have to do is create a transportation system that is dependable, one that runs frequently so that an individual will know that he or she can take mass public transportation and get where they want to go. We have to expand it all the way to the county lines. Yes, it's going to be expensive, but it's going to be worth it because in the end, if we can remove more cars from the road, then we have the ability to affect and decrease the effects of climate change. Um, the county probably has as many vehicles as any company in Harris County. It's simple. We don't need a committee. Just convert the vehicles over to renewable energy. Let's get off of fossil fuels. All the new vehicles we purchase should be the electric cars or some other source of energy, but not traditional fossil fuels. We're the largest uh, uh, landowner and uh, have buildings. So let's use alternative energy instead of using fossil fuels to heat all of the buildings that Harris County owns. All right, and Ms. Martinez? So I would say that it's not just about cooperating with TxDOT, um, but also the city and other municipalities, um, Fort Penn County, because whatever happens uh, in those neighboring areas affects Harris County as a whole. And we have to, take a look at Metro. In 2015, they um, overhauled their transportation grid, and so they're used as a model nationwide of how they um, re reorganized this the routes because it, they didn't they ve veered away from the the spoke model to what we actually have like where people are so if we're looking at um, the centers of high uh, commute areas then we should have more resources there uh, are we making a uh, Wi-Fi available I know they're piloting it in, on some routes but we want to make it where people can work on their way to work I'm sorry work on their way, you know, to the office. And then also, uh, are we making bus passes more accessible, not just for people who have smartphones or have limitations on data uh, and have to pay cash? Is there a way to make that more um, accessible where people will uh, want to ride the bus and, and use see it as more economical we have uh, the one of the lowest fares in the nation at 125 an hour but if people don't want to ride the bus because of a simple thing like not having a bench or a covered area to wait those are the simple things that can entice people to ditch their cars and use mass transit all right now what other transportation issues do you see as important to precinct three besides uh uh, the, the you know metro or public transportation are there other issues that you see as just as important as that 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 you think that you would like to to tackle and i'll start with you mr overstreet well i think uh, one of the major issues we have to to look at is 
fixing the streets, fixing the roads. And there's this belief that the county is only responsible for those roads outside of the city limits. You pay county taxes if you live in the city. And so there's no reason why you can't use county money to fix roads and to collaborate with the city of Houston and other municipalities to help fix that infrastructure. Um, and so that's, that's game plan almost number two after flooding. We've got to fix the streets. Uh, if we fix the streets, I think it's more convenient for, for people to, to travel the streets and things of that nature. Uh, we need to put sidewalks in and we need to put uh, street lights in. And it goes back and it dovetails into my safe neighborhoods, um, safe and free of crime. Okay. Uh, Ms. Martinez Alexander? Sure. So we also want to look at construction materials. Are we exploring um, materials like permeable concrete? Because if the water has somewhere to go, then that causes less problems than trying to fix something, an area that's been affected by flooding adversely. Um, another thing that we need to consider is highway expansion. So we all remember I-10 being this glorious um, project that was touted to reduce congestion, but it just brought more cars on the road. So if we look at a project like I-45 that's actually going to displace families, historically black and brown communities, and um, cause more issues uh, environmentally by ripping out you know, all of that infrastructure and then putting a tunnel underneath downtown, which sounds like a disaster to me with the, all of the water that you know, comes in our area, we have to be smarter and start thinking outside the box. We have an opportunity here to really address uh, our climate crisis and transportation hand in hand, leveraging the business resources and all of the academic resources that we have in the area and in our state to make Harris County a leader instead of a victim. Okay, Mr. Moore. Uh, in Precinct 3, uh, uh, lack of resources and maintenance is going to be a major, <coughs> a major issue while, while we grow. But uh, I want to talk about some specifics. When I was at the city of Houston, I was part of the team that helped uh, introduce SafeClear. Uh, SafeClear is now to called Tow and Go. It is, uh, most people don't even know it's there anymore. But uh, in 2019, it cleared 32,000 cars off of Houston freeways, off, off the freeways inside the city of Houston. Um, Imagine if those 32,000 cars were put back on the freeways, the, the, the congestion. The cog so the state and uh, the feds built these billions and billions of dollars of freeways and didn't do anything to clear it. We invented Safe Clear. It is a model for the country. They're getting ready to expand it in March to the entire county. We need to go region-wide with it. Uh, we need to make sure it gets, uh, HCAC has, has control of Houston Galveston Area Council. We need to make sure it's put in place for the entire county. That's one. Uh, two is we need to look at bottleneck infrastructure, uh, intersections. So many times uh, you, you, you'll, you, you can come up to an intersection and there's a bottleneck and it was built, it was built 20 years ago. And it, people, they need to take another look at it and see how the traffic can flow. Uh, there's intersections. My wife calls me a geek because I'll come up to an intersection and the right lane will have 10 feet of right turn lane. Well, if they just move the right turn lane 10 feet back, traffic would flow. You wouldn't be stuck uh, in a bottleneck. The other thing is work trucks. Now, I know the city of Houston has some kind of ordinance about work trucks in a lane of traffic. Uh, I don't think they're being uh, enforced. We need to do something about work trucks in lanes of tra traffic, especially during rush hours. They block one lane and they block everything up. Everybody's been behind them. If, if the legislature can give us one ordinance power is get those work trucks out of those lanes of traffic, move, go one block down, pull in a parking lot uh, so that uh, uh, traffic can easily flow. We need to do more on making sure the traffic actually flows. We spend billions and billions of dollars on our roads. We need to make sure they flow. Okay, and so in the meantime, while, while, you're, while the county would be working on these projects, how would you keep the traffic flowing uh, to, to maintain that traffic flow if you're going after bottlenecking uh, intersections or uh, working on permeable, replacing the uh, impermeable concrete with permeable concrete um, and, and uh, different ideas that you all have had. And I'll start with you, Ms. Alexander. What, what, look, what does that look like um, for you to keep the traffic flowing even sure. during construction? 
it's just as simple as encouraging people to carpool and use HOV lanes. Uh, so those are very easy solutions that you know we already have some infrastructure for that we can encourage people and find a way to incentive, incentivize it uh, where people feel comfortable of letting go of their cars and riding with someone else, uh, you know, make it a buddy system at their office, something to get more cars off the road in the meantime until we can uh, address these long-term solutions. Okay, Mr. Moore? It's a long-term, I uh, kind of agree with what Diana is talking about. It's a long-term project to get people out of their cars. Um, uh, people are used to getting in the car and taking off in the morning and doing the same thing in the evening. We need to come up with those alternatives. Um, the, but I'll go back to what I was talking about is that the, uh, uh, we need to do everything we can to keep those arteries that we have open. And we don't spend enough time on that. We don't spend enough time. What I would do is I'd, I'd, I'd create a traffic management team that went about and looked at all those intersections to see how we can improve those intersections to keep the traffic flowing uh, so people aren't stuck an extra minute in those intersections. Um, but that would be the, the uh, investing in keeping the traffic flow would be probably the, the uh, uh, most product productive thing we can do right now. Okay. Yeah, one fine example that we have is uh, if one travels down Main Street uh, through the medical center, um, when all of the nurses and doctors are getting off, they have uh, law enforcement officials out there stopping traffic to allow them to get out of the parking garage because it's, it's necessary. And there's a program called Selective Traffic Enforcement Program, the STEP program. And so we can manage traffic that way. Where we have bottleneck intersections, we just kind of have to allocate the resources, uh, control the traffic lights to allow traffic to flow through. And if we just do that uh, where we have problems, there's no sense in a traffic light in a high traffic area Give it, having a green light for 15 seconds or 20 seconds or 30 seconds. Let the traffic go through. If we have to put people power out there to manage the traffic, let's do that. We can do those kinds of things while we're working on solving those traffic problems. Okay, great. So uh, last question, or one of the last questions, uh, what do you feel are some of other important issues that you would like to tackle uh, if you're elected to, to the uh, commissioner's court? And uh, I'll start with you, Mr. Morris. Well, I think <clears throat> it's allocation of resources. Uh, most of my career has been in the area of criminal justice. I support the, uh, the bail reform. I think that we should not uh, spend as much time transporting individuals to jail when we can cite and release them. Um, most people who travel around Texas, every time you get a stop by a DPS officer, you don't go to jail. They give you a citation and you have to go to court. So that's a cite and release kind of program. If we start implementing those kinds of things, we can free up our law enforcement officials to work the communities. I think the presence of law enforcement will, is a deterrent to crime. Patrol the streets, patrol the neighborhoods. One of the things I don't understand in my homeowners association is we pay for a constable, we pay for deputy sheriffs, we pay for the Houston Police Department. And then we have a special assessment because we have a contract with the constable's office to patrol our neighborhoods. That doesn't make sense to me. Uh, that means I'm paying twice for the same protection. We have to figure out a way to free up our men and women in uniform to patrol our streets and make our neighborhoods safe. All right. All right. With the incumbent being in office for 31 years, we have a real opportunity to change Precinct 3 and divert some of the resources that have been devoted to maybe pet projects or people that have had long-term relationships with the commissioner's court uh, and take it to where it needs to be, to the underserved communities who don't have access to things like Head Start. There are zero um, Head Start centers that are funded by the county in Precinct 3. And also looking at medical clinics and other community resources that should be expanded in Precinct 3. That community is growing, the neighborhoods are expanding, and people need services. With the revenue cap, you have to be creative in how you are allocating those services. So being thoughtful in who's getting contracts, why are they getting 
contracts? Are the vendors treating their workers fairly? All of those decisions need to be measured and you need to look at data and figure out what the best plan is for the people and be beholden to them. All right, Mr. Moore. Um, the, uh, probably four quick things. Uh, efficiency in government, uh, as chief of staff to uh, uh, the fourth largest city in the United States, we went after inefficient parts of the government. Um, when I got to the city of Houston, people were still being handed out pagers. We got rid of 4,000 pagers. That's just an example. Uh, um, so efficiency in government. We can find efficient, we can find ways to save money to be able to put them in other areas. The second is the healthcare system. Uh, like I said, 54% of the clients uh, that go to the Harris, Harris County hospitals do not have health insurance. They have actually a pilot project that saves the county money of they buy insurance for 16,000 of their uh, clients uh, because they can buy it from the healthcare exchange. To, it saves us money. We need to figure out how to make that system more efficient. We can do that. They, they're actually pretty good at what they do. But we can make it more efficient, but we can also look at finding more resources uh, for the health, uh, our healthcare system. Sex trafficking. Uh, it is, the Harris County is one of the centers of sex, sex trafficking in the country. It is, it's just, it, it's, it's a shame, it, 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 it's wrong. Uh, we've got uh, certain areas of Precinct 3 down the Bissonette Corridor in certain areas uh, that are high crime areas. We need to do something about it. I'm, I will focus on that. And then also one of my, uh, 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 Steve Raddick, I give him a hand. He, he has did a good job on, on parks and trails. Uh, we need to do a better job. Uh, we need to be able to connect those parks and trails uh, to all the communities. Um, and then we need to expand the parks. We need to continue to expand the parks and green spaces for uh, flooding and other issues. All right. Life. So the last question uh, for you all is uh, give you a chance to tell us why you are the best candidate and how voters can learn more about your campaign. And I'll start with Diane Alexander. Okay, perfect. So um, you can check out my Facebook page, Diana Alexander 2020, and also my website, which is dianaalexander2020.com. And the reason why I got into this race is for community. So every decision that I make, every um, policy that I consider, it's within the lens of is it good for the people, financially, um, ethically, and making sure that we're providing services for the underserved. So I understand that my experience looks a little different from other people uh, in this race, but no one has the background that I have coming up looking and fighting for opportunity. And I know what it's like to have that. And so I want to make sure that we pro are providing those opportunities to others through the services that Harris County can provide through education, um, access to normal things like health care or um, fighting for um, fighting against policies like SB4. I know that that's not within the purview of county commissioner, but you can make sure that your policies are in line with uh, providing protections to immigrants whenever possible. And so those are the things that I want to fight for, and that's why I'm in this race. All right. Mr. Moore? The, uh, you can go to my website, moreforcommissioner.com, uh, or you can go to my Facebook page, uh, More for Commissioner. Uh, and uh, you'll see some videos of me uh, and, and maybe see my kids, they, uh, but you'll know a lot more about me. Um, I'm a lifelong, uh, I was raised in Precinct 3. I went to grade school, junior high, went to Lee High School, which is now Wisdom High School. Uh, so my wife is from Precinct 3. Um, I've got the experience to make a difference, uh, and that's why I've got the endorsement of former Mayor Bill White. I've got the endorsement of Commissioner Garcia. Uh, uh, Sheriff Ed Gonzalez and then also Jim Blackburn, uh, uh, among others. Um, I can get the job done. I can make a difference. I want you to please take a look at my website, take a look at me, and I'd love to earn your support. Okay. And Mr. Overstreet, you get the last word tonight. Well, you know, uh, running statewide and getting elected is no easy chore. Uh, what it does say is that I'm a hard worker and I'm a winner. In my 45 years of practicing law, I have created many systems. I've managed a district attorney's office in the Texas Panhandle where we handle budgetary problems and had to manage lawyers. Lawyers are not easy to manage. I had to create uh, a municipal court system for the city of Prairie View, a high-tech municipal court system. I did that. At Texas Southern University where I was a law professor, 
I created a clinical legal studies program that was in compliance with the rules and regulations of the American Bar Association so that every student would have an opportunity to have a real life lawyering experience. So I've had to create systems, I've had to manage people, uh, and that's what I've done for 45 years. I want to take that experience and help the people in Precinct 3 have a better quality of life. All right. Well, wonderful. Well, I appreciate all of you coming in tonight and speaking with us here on Conversations with the Candidates from the League of Women Voters. Um, we are, uh, don't forget, we're about three weeks away or so from the primary election on Super Tuesday, March 3rd. Uh, early voting begins soon. If you'd like to learn more about the League of Women Voters of Houston, you can visit the website, lwvhouston.org. And you can download the League's 411 app. That will give you access to candidate profiles uh, for all of the races in the upcoming primary. And in uh, just a few days, Houston Media Source will post this program on its YouTube channel. And it will also be available on our Facebook page, which some of you may be watching now at LWV Houston. Our next program begins at 8 o'clock with the Republican candidates for Precinct 3 looking to uh, <clears throat> take on one of our uh, guests here tonight. And for the League of Women Voters of the Houston area, I'm Tim Langford. Thank you for watching Conversations with the Candidates on Houston Media Source Television.